This is called synthesizing pseudoephedrine from methamphetamine with LLVM, as one normally does. I'm John. A um, little bit about me. I'm a cybersecurity researcher and software engineer at Fortigo, and that's it. Anyway, where, what am I doing? What, where is I going with this? Who am I? Oh, we, we literally just discussed that. All right, cool. So, yeah. So, the title... It, uh, I came up with this title because of the things that I wanted to do with um, to demonstrate the things that LLVM can actually do. So, as an analog in the real world, meth is bad, just like your code. And just like meth, bad code is easier to find and more plentiful than Sudafed. Sudafed is better. You know, it's a, it's a decongestant. Um, it can help you when you're sick. Um, so what we want to try to do is take your bad code and turn it into good code. Because it's a known fact, if you write bad code, you're a bad person. But that's okay. We can work around that. That's what LLVM is here for. Now, it's not the primary purpose of it, but you can absolutely use it for that. So, LLVM. Um, I stole this from one of my other uh, videos that I made a while ago. LLVM is all the stuff that you see here in the uh, in the green box, mostly. I mean, uh, there's other things, um, there's other parts of it, like Clang, which is part of the LLVM project. But when I say LLVM, I'm talking about um, mostly the stuff that has to do with uh, language intermediate representation um, and the, the whole pipeline of, of turning that into um, object code and a final executable. It started as a, uh, a research project um, at University of Illinois, um, Urbana-Champaign by Chris Latner and, oh goodness, I can't remember the other person. Um, they are the interim head of the computer science department at that school right now, and I cannot remember their name and I apologize. Um, Wikipedia has it. Um, but it started out as this, uh, this, this research project to uh, find different ways um, and you know, different, different efficient ways really of compiling dynamic languages or static languages. Um, and it's kind of morphed into the solution for doing anything like that at all. Um, if, you, if you are trying to build for, if you're trying to write code for a new um, architecture of some sort, you don't have to build a cross compiler with LLVM. That's, that's all handled by LLVM's backends itself. Um, most new languages, or at least the major ones that are uh, that are out now, like especially Rust, that's the first one that comes to mind. Um, that compiles down to LLVM IR, so they don't have to do anything um, related to setting up um, or, or writing code for for targeting specific architectures or anything like that. It's it's uh, it's really good stuff. Um, the other parts of LLVM, Clang, the, these are the big projects, Clang, LLD, and LLDB. Um, Clang is the compiler. Um, it was, it was uh, originally came, or funded by Apple um, as a, supposed to be a drop-in replacement for GCC. Uh, originally, GCC was the compiler for LLVM, but taking GCC's, um, I believe it's called Gimple, that's the name of their IR, and trying to translate that into LLVM was kind of a pain. So that's where Clang came from. Um, it, you can use it as a drop-in replacement for GCC and for Microsoft's uh, Visual C++ compiler. It supports more than C and C++, but those are the two that most people think of. Um, it also supports Objective-C. LLD is also uh, a drop-in linker replacement for um, LD. For the most part, there's some things that it's still struggling with, like Mako support, um, but I heard that Facebook is kind of picking up uh, the details on that, so hopefully we'll have some really good L um, LLD support for Mach O in the near future. Um, and then LLDB is their sort of their analog of GDB. Um, some of the commands are the same, well, a lot of them are. Um, it's just not quite, it's, it's not exactly meant to be a drop and replacement like the other two are. Um, I unfortunately haven't used it a lot or not enough to, to talk about it at length, but um, it has a really robust Python API with it, um, along with C and C++, so you can hook into it um, or write plugins for it fairly easily. And the best part 
about all of these, LLVM playing, LLD, LLDB, all the stuff, everything that's under the LLVM project is built as a library or a collection of libraries and all the tools, um, everything that uses these library, or that, well, that's actually, that's what I was gonna say. All the tools just hook into these libraries and are uh, compiled together with them and that's Clang, the Clang front end, um, some of the back end tools, uh, there's, a, there's a standalone back end optimizer. Um, it's just, just a front end that uses all of these libraries that are wrapped together and they use permissive licenses too. So if you want to use this stuff in a commercial project of some sort, you don't necessarily have to give away the, the source code. Um, it's most of the projects are dual licensed under MIT and there is a specific um, LLVM license, which is effectively a, a, a BSD license as well. So feel free to do with it whatever you want. So moving on from the history of LLVM and all that stuff, um, I do have a disclaimer here. So I'm just going to read this directly to you. Everything I'm about to show you is not illegal, but it probably should be. If you use any of this code in critical environments, people are going to die and you will be charged with murder at The Hague, not me. And you'll see why that is when I get to this. Um, if you actually came here trying to figure out how to synthesize meth into Sudafed, here's the paper for how to do that. Um, and, you know, real quick graph for how to do it. I don't have all the solvents and everything that are necessary, so I can't really demonstrate it. But, you know, I can at least point you in the right direction. So, here we go. So let's say you have a program that has a bunch of functions that are just too big. Um, some people say they shouldn't take up any more than, you know, like the size of a screen or a page, but those sizes are, you know, kind of relative. So um, it's better to break them up into multiple sections and, um, or smaller, smaller, you know, code segments. Now you can do this with Clang, with Clang's libraries, but I'm not talking about Clang, I'm talking about LLVM. So this is more of the, uh, the final output of your program. You can make the functions that are generated, you know, smaller. So if you, if you have to fix something after it's been put in production, you don't, you don't have to work with these, you know, huge runs of assembly or, you know, reverse engineered stuff. You can just look at these, these small little um, functions and just deal with them, you know, piecemeal. So we have a way to do this. Oh, I, uh, I accidentally switched these slides around. Yeah, so all the code for everything that I'm showing here is at uh, this GitHub address. But there's the, there's the address right here. So um, does anyone want me to actually show the code for this? I mean, it's, it, I'm not going to get real deep into it because there is a, you know, a lot of setup, a lot of infrastructure involved, but um, I, I can point out the stuff that's done, the, the stuff that I did in the code itself to actually get these things to work the way they're supposed to. Um, so this this one right here, this uh, this pass for promoting individual blocks of code into into functions. Um, I ran it against this integer scaling library, which is for mostly for pixel scaling. Um, and this is this is how it looked originally. Um, I, I forget. I'm, let me count these real quick. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So eleven functions originally. Two hundred lines of code total. Um, what this pass does is every logical separation, uh, every, every, every point in the, uh, the code where there's a, there's a logical separation of some sort. So like all the code inside an if statement or all the code inside a, uh, a while loop, for example, or if you have go to's in your code for some reason, um, separation between those different go to statements, it will take that code and promote them to their own functions. And instead of having that code in your original function, you just have a call to the newly promoted function. Um, and I, I should say that so this IR comes from the C code. So when, when Clang compiles the code down, it doesn't compile it all the way directly to you know, final executable. It compiles it to IR, intermediate representation. And that's what these passes are working on. So eight functions for this library um, a total of, like I said, about 200 lines of code. These are the actual commands to run that. So we compile it with Clang++, tell it to emit LLVM instead of going straight to, you know, um, an 
object file or a final uh, executable of some sort. So it spits out this .bc file, integer scaling .bc. Then we use LLVM's opt tool, which is op optimizer. Load the pass plugin DLL, because I'm doing this on Windows, um, which is amazing because this didn't used to work on Windows. It used to be exclusively um, a Linux thing, but it works on Windows. Um, and then we tell it what passes to run, and that's all defined in the pass itself. And then, you know, the file to run it against. And then the call graph turns into this. So now we have, I don't know how many functions. <laughs> there's, there's some more. Um, and so, yeah, this final uh, clang command to actually convert it into a, um, an object file. But we can do a little bit better than this. We can convert each instruction into its own function. Now, that's, this is an IR instruction, not um, assembly level instruction, because some IR instructions, when they get lowered to um, object code, they get converted into, they can get converted into more than one native instruction. So now we have 348 functions out of 200 lines of code. So those are really, really tiny, like one line. That's perfect. That's super easy to debug. You just one, one line right in your, in your disassembler, and there it is. There's your, there's your one move statement, and you're good to go. Simple, simple stuff. Super easy to read, too. So this is, this is the other part of it. So now you have all these functions. There's a dark side to everything. You have all these functions that you've created, and calling functions is not you know, nearly as efficient as just a jump or a relative jump of some sort. So what if you want to take all those functions and combine them, um, you know, into even fewer functions than what you had before? Well, that's, you know, that's called inlining um, at source level. But when it's being built, you can also force things to be inlines too. Now, normally, so there's a built-in inliner in Clang and LLVM, and normally it does some sort of cost um, calculation to determine if it's actually worth it to inline um, a function or not. But we're trying to do this for efficiency. We don't really care about size. So um, this pass that I wrote called fuse functions will do everything that it possibly can to, uh, it, it, it ignores, it ignores all costs. Um, and uh, so <laughs> breaking character here for a minute, this one was really hard to write because some, some, uh, programs will use up every single, like all, 100% of the resources that I have in my build server. 192 gigs of RAM completely taken up uh, because of the way the optimizer works. It takes all the code and saves it in memory. And so when it's inlining functions that them, themselves have inlined code in them, um, depending on the call graph and how, you know, if you have a bunch of um, highly connected functions that call each other, depending on when they get, when, when the inliner gets to them in the inlining pass, they could have millions of instructions in them that have just been duplicated. So, um, yeah, I had, I, I tested this on one uh, program, which was, it's really sort of a, um, it's a, it's a Nintendo emulator um, for debugging NES games. I figured it would be simple enough to to get this to show how this works and i couldn't i couldn't get it working i couldn't get it to spit out everything that it needed to because it used up all 190 192 gigs of ram um and you know kind of it took about 30 minutes to do that but um i was watching it while it was doing it and it was doing exactly what it was supposed to it was still in lining it wasn't stuck it was just the functions grew so large um that it couldn't do anything with it so this is 7-Zip, um, specifically uh, a fork of, well, the version of 7-Zip that's meant to be built for Windows. This is the, the call graph tree for it. Um, so, yeah, the original function count, 1,442, 643 kilobytes. Um, after running it through this fuse functions pass, you can get it down to 344 functions. And it's only um, meg and a half in size, you know, not too bad. Um, there are some things I would like to do. I think, I think this pass could actually be useful. Not so, not so much this just completely ignorant inlining, um, pass, but some of the stuff that I had to do to get it as far as it would go, like, uh, <coughs> taking, uh, multiple 
multiple function calls to the same function within an existing function, <coughs> pardon me, and then uh, collapsing them into a single call. Um, I didn't write that myself. I stole that from another pass. Um, there's another project called Shell LVM that, that does that. Um, but I had to take it even further and um, make it so that once another function went, was inlined, it would check again to see if there were duplicate uh, function calls being made because the original one didn't do that. <coughs> and um, it took a while. I think I spent more time on this than anything else that you're going to see in here. <coughs> Pardon me. I guess I need to keep drinking. I don't know, maybe it's COVID. It's possible. You know. But we have treatment for it now. So, um, this this third point right here, this is uh this is something that I have run into um you know in the last month when I was playing around with this. Um I have a bunch of functions that have the same prototype. And uh while I'm debugging them, I want to just see what happens if I change the uh the function that's being called with the same parameters. Um, really useful for debugging in very specific situations, <laughs> but um, there's no easy way to do that uh, other than you know, running it through um, Ida uh, and then hoping Ida doesn't crash because I seem to have that problem. It, it seems to hate me. So I wrote this pass that will convert every single function call that it knows about, direct function calls, where call address into call register. So then you can just drop the function pointer into the register that's being called. Um, and then, you know, it's easy to play around with uh, your call graph that way. Yes, it could be math too. Yes, it could be that. Except I don't have any because it's illegal. What I do have is not in this office, but it's still legal. Thank you for pointing that out. I, I, I totally forgot about that. So this is what this is what the original code looked like disassembled. Um, these are the um, the Itanium name mangling for C++. So uh, really difficult to read, but these are template functions. Um, so what this pass does is it finds all these direct calls like this, and it calls, uh, it, it assigns it um, a number. So down here, this first, this first templated number is 1C8. Uh, the second call is 1C9, 1CA, and it passes that value to this function called prize exchange. Um, I don't know how familiar any of you are with Pachinko. Um, the name of this pass being Pachinko Calls. Pachinko is a, uh, it's like an arcade game, sort of, in Japan. Um, the best analogy I have for it is if you have a TV, and the only way that you can watch TV, this TV that you have, is to... Um, feed money into a paper shredder that will only take money. And as long as that shredder is still running, then the TV still runs. That's basically what Pachinko is. Um, except you can win prizes. I haven't figured out how that happens, but uh, you, you can win prizes. But in Japan, gambling is technically illegal. So um, what you do is you take these prizes uh, from that you get from playing Pachinko, and you take them to this little window, and the people behind the window, they buy these prizes from you. So um, it, they make it real convenient to just sell these, these prizes right there. It's amazing. It's every single one of them has something like that. Real convenient. So um, that's effectively what this function does. This, this prize exchange function, and I wish I would have shown the code that um, is actually generated for this. All it does is it reads this number that gets, that gets passed to it, and it returns a function pointer to the proper function. It's a giant switch statement. That's all there is to it. But that switch statement was generated using this, this pass. It was generated dynamically. So call graph of, uh, this is still 7-zip before. And then afterwards, you have this nice, uh, I don't know, kind of looks like a Pokemon to me. I don't know much about Pokemon, so I'm probably wrong. And they all call this prize exchange function down here, plus all these other ones. That, uh, that call directly into it. This group of functions right here, I'm pretty sure are um, external functions that can't be changed anyway. And then over here uh, on the right side, this, this rectangular group of dots, those are other functions that probably only call things indirectly anyway. So um, it you know, doesn't know what it, what's being called directly. Um, 
So yeah, you can generate really cool art by using passes. It's pretty neat. All right. <laughs> so I was helping someone at work with this yesterday, someone who kept forgetting to set breakpoints, um, trying to figure out why their code was crashing. So um, I figured this pass would probably help, help them out um, if they were you know, building their code. If you forget to set a breakpoint, this one will do it for you. It will do it after every single IR instruction, except with, with the exception of uh, there's there's a handful, three different three different instructions: uh, stack allocation instruction, um, fee node, which is a magic instruction that sets a value based on code flow where it's coming from, and then uh, there's some exception handling instructions where you can't can't really put uh, breakpoints right after them. So. Um, this this code right here this is what it looked like originally um making a well eventually making a call to printf and then after this pass is run on it perfect look at this we have int three int three int three int three so no matter what you, you don't have to worry about you know not setting breakpoints this it will do it for you and you don't have a choice so you can you just step through you don't even have to do like the regular step through commands you can just run the program and it'll stop for you after every instruction. So um, this this group of move instructions right here, followed by the call and the uh, the exclusive or that's one of the things I was I was talking about where some IR instructions don't get lowered directly to a single native instruction. This is this is uh, this is called um, an instruction bundle. I don't know what instruction was here originally in IR, but um, that's why there's no uh, debug trap instructions between them. Stack bloat. Oh, right. Yeah. Okay. So, um, magic numbers, this sort of relates to that. If you have, um, just values laying all over your code and there's, there's no description for them. Um, it, again, we can't really do anything about that using just LLVMs optimizations, but we can at least separate those values into their own section. And, um, we can, you know, take them out of the stack. Too. So you're not putting all these weird values on the stack. So this pass does that, finds, finds every value that has um, an allocated stack slot and converts it into a global variable. So the other cool thing about this is that now the state of your program is globally accessible. So you can access values from completely unrelated functions if you wanted to. It's, it's great um, because not only does it make them global, it makes them externally available too. So other programs running outside of your process space could hook into these and you know read whatever values that you know you they wanted or change them. Um, so it's really really good for inter process communication that way. So this is what it looked like before. Um, all these uh, stack references here. So then, okay, right? Okay. So seventy two bytes being subtracted from the stack. There was originally one thousand nine hundred seventy six symbols. After running this pass, only 56 bytes. We saved 16 bytes, which is phenomenal just for this one function. This is for stack allocation. And you know, now there's 6,800 symbols too. But you, as you can see, everything goes to a, uh, a global, global variable of some sort too. So, all right, mission accomplished. And uh, I believe this is the last one right here. Um, so <laughs> when you write code that uses malloc or new or, you know, mmap, depending on how you're using it um, on Windows, if you're, if you're calling heap alloc or virtual alloc or whatever, um, Windows, at least, when you call those, uh, the virtual alloc functions will give you a page of memory, no matter what, no matter what size you give it, is at least rounded to a page size. Other functions don't do that. Um, and when you when you call those other functions and you give them less than a page of memory, you don't know you know where they're going to be aligned. I guess unless you have the code for it, um, you don't you don't know how how it's going to be aligned. You're forcing the operating system to manage all of this segmented memory, um, depending on how often you allocate and what sizes you allocate for. So this pass fixes that. Every single allocation becomes eight kilobytes because that's the minimum size page 
on um, UltraSpark. So we went with the lowest common denominator here. Most other systems use 4K, but we can't, you know, we're trying to be compatible with other systems, so we leave it at 8K. So this was a function for, for demonstrating this. Please forgive me for mixing C and C++. Um, I, I was very tired when I wrote this. <laughs> um, it was, it's easier to find malloc than it is to find uh, um, the, uh, the new function because it's, uh, it's also name mangled. So originally this malloc call right here um, passes four to malloc because that's the size of the int. So after this pass is run, 8K. So if you give it um, like 8,193 bytes, you will end up with an allocation of 16,384 bytes because it always rounds up to the next page boundary. Well, pseudo page boundary, I guess, in this case, because like I said, 8K. 8K might not be a page on um, Windows or, I'm, I mean, I'm sorry, on x86, Windows or Linux, wherever, but it's still uh, a 4K page boundary either way. So... Oh, did you guys see that, by the way? I'm not sure. Hold on. Let me go back. So, yeah, it, al it does this allocation a thousand times. So, normally, you'd have 4,000 bytes, right? Hardly noticeable here in the difference uh, of memory usage. But after the transformation, it goes from using 2 megs to 11 megs. But that's only while it's running. It's, you know, it's not a, not a big deal. And it's fast. And I, <laughs> I know um, that this is, you know, I'm, I'm breaking character again here, kind of joking about this, but... I honestly, when I benchmarked this, I did see a speed increase by doing this. I don't know if that's actually related, but um, I wish I had saved benchmarks. Um, be something, some, something about this caused it to be faster, and I don't know if it actually has anything to do with page alignment or not, um, because when I turned it back off, that, that uh, speed increase went away. So, and that's all I have. Was that even 30 minutes? I guess it was. So, thank you for your time. Does anyone have any questions? So, John, it looks like all of the um, transformers that you were writing are in C++. Indeed. And is that basically the, the only platform that you can use to, uh, to write these? Or do they have, like, Python interfaces? Or... There, there are bindings for um, Python, for sure. Um, you don't have to use C++ either. There's the... Uh, the other ones that are directly supported by LLVM are C. Um, a, there's a Go binding that's actually part of the LLVM project itself also. Um, I have, you know, I have the code right here. We can just take a look real quick if you want, if you want me to give you the full list of what's included. LLVM bindings. Okay. <laughs> so I said Go and Python. Well, there's also OCaml. That's what's built in. Um, there are also... <laughs> bindings for um, Java, but it's not, it's not, it's not done by uh, LLVM. It's a third party thing, but it seems I'm told I haven't tried this yet. I need to use it because I really want to try this out with Ghidra. Um, there's yeah, Java bindings for it too. Um, speaking of which, I have a question for you. Do you think, uh, do you think that would work in Ghidra loading, uh, loading these, um, loading all of LLVM into Ghidra? <laughs> yeah. Thinking no, but we'll we'll uh, we'll have to have an offline talk about it. <laughs> gotcha. All right. You got me very interested. What's that, Tracy? You really want to use all the memory? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have a pass for that. I don't know if you saw that. This was not originally. So this is 634 lines of code. Well, yeah, not really. <laughs> There's there is more to it than that. This was originally something like 100 lines, and it did, just didn't work out that well. The uh the very aggressive code inliner. Oh, yes, yes, sorry, Tracy, I see that now. Rust, um, I, I, I'm not the least bit surprised that there are Rust bindings for LLVM considering uh, Rust uses LLVM. And uh, Fortran, yes, there is, that's actually part of um, the LLVM project now, Flang, um, a full Fortran compiler, compiles down to uh, LLVM IR for all of your Fortran needs. So Ben asked a question about recursion, and I'm not exactly sure what he means by that. But... What about recursion? Ah, right. So probably the function inlining pass, I'm assuming. So, yeah. Um... <laughs> I'm just curious what happens when a, uh, when a 
runs into a recursive function. So um, there is a check here in the code uh, basically for that. I have to find it now. What function are we in? This is, nope, not this one, not demote registers. So basically it, it doesn't handle recursion. It doesn't, it doesn't inline functions that call themselves. Um, now, <laughs> if a function calls another function, which itself would basically calls back, um, that's a different issue. Um, eventually, when if those if those functions converge when they're being inlined, it'll detect that there's a call being made more than once um, to the same function, and it'll it'll collapse those down into a uh, a single call. And if that call is itself, it'll just leave it there the way that it is. Um, because I don't, I don't think I'd have to go back and look at LLVM's code, but I, I don't think they do anything with, um, with recursive functions directly, uh, either for, for that exact reason. So in general, it sounds like be careful how you use it with recursive. Well, listen, you shouldn't be using these at all anyway. That's the whole point. Um, <laughs> please, please don't do this. <laughs> um, but yes, so, um, it will it will not work it, if you give it something if you give it a recursive function it won't it won't inline it um if yeah if it if there is a loop there though you yeah you might run into problems and i didn't really write the logic to to dig down and find that um there is a uh, so there's there's four types of passes that LLVM has there's a, a module level pass which is a module is like um you can think of it as one one compilation unit or one translation unit. That's that's a module. Um, you can link multiple modules together to also be one module. Um, uh, LLVM has a as an IR linker that lets you do that. Um, there's then there's a um, call graph strongly connected components pass, which um, I haven't really found a lot of good documentation about, but there that's what LLVM's built-in inliner uses, um, which it generates a call graph first before doing any sort of inlining. Um, like I said, I really couldn't figure out how to use it and it wasn't um, it wasn't obvious how to use it from from what was available um, in, in the inliner code. And the inliner code is really complex too, so I didn't really want to dig through all of it. But um, it is possible to use that to find out if a function, if there's a call loop of some sort, and then you could avoid that in that case, or uh, maybe generate um, a func instead of just inlining that uh, that function directly, um, or whatever functions are causing um, effective recursion in that case. Um, the, the inliner that I wrote uses a module level pass, um, which is, like I said, one step above the... Uh, one one scope level above um, the call graph pass. Um, it's, in theory, you could use a function level pass to do this too if you wanted, but that would be insane. Um, and the other the other pass uh, type is a, is a loop level pass where it, it specifically finds loops in um, the IR code um, and only only passes those loop blocks to your optimization pass. Whereas function pass, like I said, that's each individual function. That's what gets passed to your pass to work on. Am I the only one drinking? This is pathetic. I got more here. Should probably drink them before they go warm. Ugh. So, I kind of got a dumb question. I have a dumb answer. Sweet. Um, if you had ingested, like, say, all of Lipsy or something like that, and you happen to know, um, what you are targeting, you might be able to use LLVM's transformation stuff here to rewrite your program as a series of ROP gadgets then, right? You could. Um, so that, so uh, yeah, here, let me, uh, let me go back to this one slide here or the layers of, uh, I don't know, I don't know how well you can see this. So the stuff, uh, these passes that I have written here are at the, the regular, IR level, which is sort of um, platform independent, sort of. Um, below that, that IR gets lowered, code generated to machine IR, which is very target specific, you know, very processor specific. 
Um, it looks a little bit more like native assembly at that point. That's where you could, if you really wanted to, just generate a bunch of ROP gadgets for your code. Um, that would be by far the easiest place to do that. And yes, you absolutely could do that. Wow. Wow, that's really cool. Yeah, I, I, I really like using it. I don't use it for anything like that, but, <laughs> you know, it's the... <laughs> I have a I have a I have a page um, at work that lists absolutely terrible ideas, and um, these are actually some some of the some of the the stuff that I uh, that I wrote came from those pages. There's there's other things too, like making sure that every string that's passed to a uh, a Windows file function is exactly 260 characters in length, because that's your limit, even if you know well, at least with ASCII. So doesn't matter what size string is, make it 260. If shorter than that, expand it. If it's longer than that, chop it off at 260. Um, other things like detecting if you're calling uh, um, some asynchronous code um, that isn't really multi-threaded and replace that asynchronous code with just constant, really tightly looped polls, which is really good for, for performance. That's the best way to do it is, you know, just a while loop. While true, pull. Yes, very evil. <laughs> I don't recommend doing this. <laughs> I don't recommend doing any of this. The, the whole point of this was just to show, like, um, I talked to someone back in March about um, just, so I made, I made a video a while ago. Let me start there. About, for, for beginners, if you want to write an LLVM optimization, how you would do it. And someone, someone mentioned that um, the knowledge barrier to, to getting started in LLVM is extremely high. And I'll admit it can look a little, um, it can look a little daunting at first, but um, I've been working with this for, oh boy, how long? I, uh, what year is this? I don't know, it's been two or three years. I, my medication's wearing off, so I'm not sure. But, um, right. <laughs> um, it was way far easier for me to get into this, uh, working with LLVM's API to do the, these sorts of things than um, when I had tried it, to be fair, years ago with GCC. Um, GCC does not have the, uh, the, doesn't have the, the, the accessibility that LLVM has. Um, and the LLVM dev community is, Super cool. Um, you can send them any question, effectively, any question that you want about uh, LLVM or how to do something. And even if it isn't documented, someone will reply and tell you exactly how to do it. Um, and, you know, point you to where the code is in LLVM that does something similar to what you want to do or, you know, um, something like that. But it's uh, it's not as challenging to start working with LLVM as you might think. That's that's really all I'm trying to say. Aaron, yes, yes, you could. You could take an existing backend and, um, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. Like, <laughs> it, the uh, the x86 code, the x86 backend in LLVM is. Fairly impenetrable. Um, I'll be the first to admit. <laughs> so um, you could take an existing backend and tweak it to do the stuff that you want, like you know, specify the native instructions that you want. Um, but you, if you can get away with it by not doing that, by not tweaking the backend, it's far better to do it that way. To do it at the, the machine IR level, or um, if you can at the IR level, it's it's it is a lot easier. Sure, RISC-V, yeah. Yes, you could do that with RISC-V. Um, well, I mean, you could do it with all of them, but yes, RISC-V would probably be much easier for, for doing that. Um, you could give it... Um, if, if you wanted to uh, make up your own file format, your own binary file format, um, instead of just ELF or PE, you could do that too. Um, I kind of experimented with that a little bit when I was writing a, just, just a toy operating system kernel for uh, Raspberry Pi, because I wanted something that I could just drop down and, um, you know, the only thing that's in the header is just 
just what's needed to uh, lay out where the code is um, and then you know just run it. Um, it's <laughs> that also requires tweaking the backends a little bit because they don't know about your custom file format, but it's far easier than um, than trying to tweak the existing file formats to do you know whatever you want. And um, like I was saying with LLD, the LLVM's final executable linker, their support for Mach O is it's not very good right now. So if you're if you're trying to use it to do um, you know st Darwin stuff or um, you know writing programs for Apple, um, I would. <laughs> There were some bugs that I've had to fix that, and I don't know, I don't know Mako, I don't know, I don't know Darwin or any of that stuff. Um, it's, there just was so much stuff wrong with it. It's, it's far better just to stick with um, Apple's native linker in that case. Um, they have their own version of, uh, well, I mean, they use LD64, their own, their own linker, but um, don't use the one that comes with LLVM if you're trying to do Apple stuff, really. That's all, that's all I'm trying to say. Have I sworn yet? Did I say any swear words yet? I totally forgot. No, you're being way too peaky. Fuck. I didn't mean to. Uh, someone someone did ask a question on Twitch. What language is this? Oh, C++. Yes, C++. Everything that I've shown is C++. But, yes, there are other bindings. You don't have to use C++. All of them. English, mostly. I'm trying to see if I have any other code to show off from, from this. This code, I just made it public before uh, before doing a presentation. And like I said, not a lot of it is, is documented, especially the stuff that I wrote in the last week. Um, but um, if you want to look at it and don't know what something does, by all means, you know, you can hit me up and I'll... Or you could probably ask the LLVM dev mailing list too and they tell you, even though it's not their code. Let's find out. All right, yeah, all right. Let's take this... Uh, Let's take this program that doesn't have any, uh, we can do that, right? I have, I'll just take the benchmark here for resizing malloc. We'll take the, uh, the pass that inserts the, um, the debug breakpoints between every instruction. And I'm pretty sure I can tell you exactly what's going to happen. There's going, at least on Windows, there's going to be a, a pop-up dialog asking me which debugger I want to use. It'll say the program's crashed with a debug breakpoint, which is sort of an oxymoron. So, I do have it here. Okay. I have to look up. If you want to share your screen again, feel free to. I can't read it from here. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, unless that's your tactic. Thank you. Not a problem. Okay. So I did have a, I did have a, a pass that I was working on where it would print out, um, you make a call to puts. Uh, put string, I guess, <laughs> at the beginning of every function and at the return of every function. And um, I don't know why it wasn't working. The code that I was generating was exactly the same as the put string code that was being compiled normally and working, um, but it would crash every time. I have no idea why. Maybe I'll debug it later. That code is actually up on the, the GitHub repo too if anyone else wants to look at it. So this was breakpoint net. Oh, right. Not this one. We will give it the resize mock test and then we will write it to You know what? I just realized 
no one has seen what IR actually looks like. Or at least I haven't shown that. But that's okay. Because I'll do that now. My machine really does not like, okay, that was the wrong one. <laughs> I think I wrote it out to itself. No, I didn't. Okay. This right here though, this is an example of what IR looks like. Maybe easier to read. So S printf. So, you know, alloc, these are just allocating stack slots. These static ones have to go at the beginning of a function. Um, call load you know simple instruction names things like that um these are some intrinsic function calls yes all of this in uh static single assignment form so infinite number of registers they're virtual registers that's why they have an infinite number of them they can only be assigned to once and then they can be read from uh, however often they want um, i'm trying to find something that has some basic blocks in it too right here so these are unnamed. So this 23 right here is just, it's like a label. Uh, BR being, you know, unconditional branch to label 26, which is down here. This is the fee node instruction I was talking about. Um, this I32 is the return type for, for this, uh, this instruction. And what this means is if the code that flowed to this, to this block right here, um, 26, came from block 23, which is right here, then it sets this value to negative one. Otherwise, if it came from block 24 right here, it sets this, this register to whatever is in 25. So anyway, that's that. Um, Size So you use you can use clang um, to take IR so that BC stands for bit code. Um, that's the binary version, binary representation of um, LLVM, intermediate representation. Um, you can use clang to just compile it directly to uh, a final executable. So that's what I'm going to do here. And let's go ahead and run it. Aha! <laughs> Negative one. So apparently that's what happens. Now, if we actually run it through a debugger, yes. So it triggers on the uh, debugger <laughs> loader pointer do debugger break. So yeah, it does. It does break on the uh, on the int three, which is that's that's as designed. I'm honestly just surprised that it didn't, um, at least on my machine, that it didn't pop up with a uh, um, a debugging dialog of some sort. That's kind of strange. <coughs> so if we continue running it, yep, does it again and again and again and again and again. And the address is changing. This is exciting stuff. Cool, anyone else have any questions or thoughts? Is that better? This is much better, isn't it? Looking good. Only all the time. This is nothing new. Yeah, I don't have a problem sticking around if anyone wants to talk about anything either. That's fine. I'll stay here until I'm, a la I'm the last person. I'm not joking. <laughs> have I lost weight? Um, no. I have, I have, uh, I've gained 10 pounds since I don't know when. Sometime.
There's no marker there. This was a question in Twitch, by the way. All right, yeah, if no one has any other questions, uh, we'll close official event. But if you want to stick around, I guess that's also cool. Thank everyone for coming. Thank you, John. Yes, thank you very much for, for watching this. I mean, I know a bit about LLVM. It's good to see in real, like, in real life, you know, applications and, yeah, interesting. Thank you again. This is great. Not a problem.